praise you that your steadfast love endures forever. We praise you for the pictures of Jesus in these lessons. We praise you that he is the source of living water now and forever. We praise you for his life-giving power. And we ask, Father, that you would help us as we sort through the details of these lessons to learn and see and behold Christ, that we would be so filled with him and his Holy Spirit that we would treasure him above all, that we would carry him with us, that we would live for him now and forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I feel like I should have a big drum roll here because we're about to announce our study for next year. People have been asking and we've been successfully putting it off. So I'm, I'm actually amazed that we've made it this far. Uh, we are going to start off September with the studies of Ruth and First and Second Samuel. Uh, that's an 18-week study, and then we'll be finishing up the year with a 12-week study in the book of Ephesians. Uh, so it's good, actually, that we're continuing with the Old Testament in September because it kind of helps us to trace what happened to these people. Uh, it doesn't exactly pick up where we left off, but it's a, it's, it's, it's a way of seeing uh, what happens in the end. Uh, these Old Testament books of Ruth and First and Second Samuel describe the journeys of people like us. I mean, some of them happen to be prophets, priests, and kings, but they still struggle in the same ways that we do. They experience the same triumphs and failures, broken relationships, trauma, just like us. So we're going to learn about people who take their anger and their pain to God and those who do not. And we will see in each case how God remains faithful to his people. We're going to kick off the year with Ruth. It is a beautiful, beautiful book, albeit very short. So it's just one week in Ruth uh, in which we will learn and read about the hope of a redeemer. And then when we move to, and then second, first and second Samuel has some very, you know, fascinating famous stories uh, like the call of Samuel, Israel's first human king, David and Goliath, David and Bathsheba, uh, just to name a few. And then when we finish the year up with the 12 weeks in Ephesians, we will learn that before the foundations of the earth were laid, God had his people in mind. His love, he, in his love, he chose and forgave and redeemed them. He adopted them to be his very own beloved children. Ephesians tells us the story of God's eternal plan to unite people who had been estranged from him and from one another into a beautiful community that reflects his glory to the world. Uh, this study will guide you through what it means to be reconciled with God, how that is possible, and along with the amazing benefits that God gives as a result, and there's a lot of practical guidance about how to apply these eternal truths to your everyday life. So I look forward to the study. I think it's going to be a wonderful one. It's a new study for CBS, and I hope that you'll all join us. We start our registration next, the week after next, when we come back from break on April, the week of April 17th. Uh, so we're opening registration up to everyone who's enrolled in the class first for two weeks, and then we open it up to the outside world. So this is my yearly, uh, it's a reminder or sort of a nagging, I'm not quite sure what you would call it, but if you have children and you would like to have them in the program, please register the first week because our children's program always fills up and I hate to have to turn anyone away, especially anybody who's been in the class. So come prepared to register when we come back. Write yourself a little note in your calendar or your notes, uh, and don't forget to register. Okay? All right, open up your Bibles, please, to Numbers chapter 20. And I think that uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read the whole thing. 
but open up because I will um, be referencing particular verses that we will go to, uh, and you can follow along with me and track with me, make sure I'm saying the right thing. Uh, please don't assume that I will say the right thing. Check to make sure I'm saying the right thing. Uh, I would say, honestly, that this is probably the saddest chapter in the whole Old Testament. Um, it is a tough chapter for Moses. The death of his sister, the death of his brother, and the declaration from God himself that he will never bring his people into the promised land. He will never get to do the thing that he has spent the last 40 years of his life doing. Very sad. Very heavy. Uh, we are nearing the end of these 40 years of wilderness wanderings at this point in the story, and we're sort of longing for a happy ending, right? Thinking that maybe at this point in the story, things should be getting a little bit easier by now, uh, but I'm afraid <laughs> that we have a pretty accurate picture of the Christian life right here. It's not easy, right? It is filled with both blessings and trials, and there is no guarantee of a smooth road, not even in the end. And if someone tells you that there is a smooth road, they are mistaken. We are a people who are sorrowful, but always rejoicing. Uh, there is a lot to be sad about, but there is much to be rejoicing in. Uh, there um, is, even in the midst of all of the sadness here in chapter 20, uh, there is gospel hope. There is a picture of the steadfast, enduring love of the Lord, the continued presence and the ministry of the Lord toward his people. And this is a new generation. This first generation that experienced the Red Sea miracle had mostly passed by now, and these are their children, still living out God's covenant promise to Abraham that he had made so long before. And they are about to begin the next part of God's plan, entrance into and conquest of the promised land. Uh, Numbers chapter 20 outlines the third and final travel, travel narrative in the books of Exodus and Numbers. The first leg of the journey, you recall, was from the Red Sea to Sinai. The second was from Sinai to Kadesh. And now here in Numbers 20 and 21, we see the third and final journey from Kadesh to just across the Jordan River, the Transjordan, uh, just before the children of Israel go into the promised land. Now you remember what happened immediately following the crossing of the Red Sea. Yes, Miriam, the sister of Aaron and Moses, led the victory celebration and sang, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Miriam's unbridled joy and praise was part of the kickoff of the first leg of their journey. And now it seems almost fitting that her death marks the beginning of the last part of their journey. It starts off pretty gloomy, and it ends on the banks of the Jordan River with a glorious view of that broad and spacious promised land. Miriam was quite a person, probably the most important woman in Israel at the time. I mean, imagine where the story would have gone without her. Picture young Miriam discreetly watching Moses in his basket among the reeds of the Nile River. How smart she was, how quick thinking, how brave she was to have the courage to approach Pharaoh's daughter at such a young age, uh, to be able to think on her feet and say, you know what, I could find a Hebrew woman to nurse that baby for you, and to be so concerned with the safety of her little brother. She must have loved him very much. Without that one decisive move, this story would have had a very different ending. How would Moses ever have known what it meant to be Hebrew? How would he have ever learned 
about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had he not had the chance to learn it from his own mother. Miriam was not perfect, of course. She and Moses had their moments, as most siblings do, but she was an important part of this story. She was a godly woman with tremendous influence, but even with her influence, she does not get to go into the promised land, and that is the recurring sadness of this chapter and the recurring reality that even the best of us are flawed. And when we place our hope and expectation in others, in those that we admire, we are often left disappointed. Our hope can never be in anyone other than the flawless one. And praise God, there is a flawless one who never disappoints. And this chapter reminds us that the privilege of the promised land is no small thing. And the message of these chapters is that only Yeshua can take us there. So now we come to uh, water trouble again as our lesson describes it. It's worth mentioning, I think, that the Israelites seem to have no sympathy for the fact that Moses is grieving over the loss of his sister. Uh, there appears to be no consideration for him whatsoever. They give it to him pretty hard, uh, and they don't seem to mind kicking him when he's down. You hit just the second verse and think, wow, nothing is new or different. None of the complaining or the accusing is even tempered at all for the sake of his loss. And you think, I, I, I've seen this movie before. <laughs> there is no water they assemble themselves against Moses and Aaron and start fighting with some pretty familiar words. We wish we had died with the others. Why have you brought us out here to die? Why did you make us leave Egypt? There's no good food, nothing to drink. Same old, same old. The only new thing is that this is a different batch of people. This is generation number two. So Moses and Aaron do what they do. They go to the tent of meeting. They fall on their faces. Just a little side note here. I hope, and I pray, actually, that we are both instructed and inspired by how much time they spend on their faces in prayer before the Lord. They're not approaching him with a high hand in a lofty, prideful way. They're on their faces. It is their knee-jerk reaction. It seems that they do not spend time discussing their options and then praying. They go right to praying first. The Lord says, take the staff Assemble the congregation, you and Aaron, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. In verse 8, it says, so you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. Uh, and then it reminds us of another story, doesn't it, from Exodus 17. And we can't really talk about this story in Numbers 20 without talking first about the other story in Exodus 17. In the first water from rock story, the people, now mind you, this was the first generation of Israelites to be freed from Egypt. These were the adults who crossed the Red Sea. In the Numbers 20 story, it was their children who grumbled. So, like parent, like child, it's a sobering thing to think that our children may very well repeat the patterns of sin that they see in us, that they have learned from us. May the Lord protect us from making the same mistakes. May our children see us on our knees in prayer and not just hearing our litany of complaints. In Exodus 17, there was no water. The people complained, and they went straight to the old, why did you bring us out here to kill us thing? And Moses responded in verse 2, why do you quarrel with me? 
Why do you test the Lord? And Moses touches on a very important point in that question to them. He knows basically that it's not just him that they're mad at, it's God. It is not just him who is on trial there, it's really the Lord. And since the people are accusing God of wrongdoing and abandoning Israel to die in the wilderness of thirst, of failing to keep his promise to them and his covenant with Abraham, they, the people, are testing God. They are judging him, as we often do when we don't think that God is handling our lives the way that we think that he should. The Israelites are essentially accusing God in Exodus 17 of being a covenant breaker. Now, God had told the people, he had warned them that he was going to test them. He brought them there to test them. Because it is God who's the one who gets to do the testing, right? We do not get to test God. He tests us. He should never be on trial. We should be on trial because we are the ones who have offended him. But God, in his great mercy and humility, in this scenario, takes on the position of the, of the accused in Exodus 17. And the implications are huge and they are prophetic. He says in Exodus 17, 6, the Lord says, I will stand there before you on the rock at Horeb. Now, that's something we can just quickly breeze through and not fully get the weight of, but that is an astonishing statement that the Lord makes. Because after all, man stands before God, right? We are the accused, not God before man. This is the language of an accused person in a court of law. I stand before you as though you will determine my guilt or innocence. God is standing in the place of the accused. He's being accused by the people. God stands on the rock. That's what he says. I will stand there before you on the rock at Horeb. He stands on the rock and he identifies with the rock. God is described as a rock all over scripture, right? He is my rock and my redeemer. There are a million places in which God is called the rock. And then God tells Moses to lift his rod of judgment and strike the rock on which God stands and with which he symbolically identifies. God is not guilty, but he bears the judgment. The rock at Massa, which means testing, struck for God's people is a type of Christ a foreshadowing of the incarnate, perfect son of God, the spotless lamb who endured the punishment for sin. He absorbed the strike. He took the blow of God's wrath. This rock pointed to and foreshadowed Jesus. That's why this whole event is so significant. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4, uh, this is what he says. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. And here's my point, so please listen carefully. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Paul, in the New Testament, to his letter to the Corinthians, identified that rock as Christ. This rock represented Jesus. In Exodus 17, Moses was told to strike the rock. He struck the rock instead of striking the people. It was to show God's mercy and grace and willingness to absorb their sin, even though they had accused God of abandoning them to death. Moses struck the rock and water flowed to save the people. Jesus, the rock, was struck for our salvation. Instead of striking us, God struck his son. God himself is submitting to the blow of his own justice. Amazing thought. Now here, in Numbers 20, Moses 
is told to get water from a rock again, but this time God tells him to speak to the rock and out of, the, out of it would flow water. Moses and Aaron had assembled all the people and Moses was only to tell the rock to yield water, but instead, in a fit of uncharacteristic anger, and I don't blame him, he speaks in anger, and in doing so, he also usurps the place of God, saying, here now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses struck the rock two times. Water came out, and they all drank. That was God's mercy to them. But the Lord said to Moses, because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. Now, I used to think that that was a pretty harsh punishment for Moses after all that he had done, but I don't think so anymore. God told Moses to speak to the rock, not to strike it. And this rock foreshadowed Jesus. And it was to be struck once, only once. Jesus was struck one time, crucified once, once for all. And after that, he is to be spoken to. Like the rock, when Jesus was struck, water flowed from his side he died the death we deserve. By believing him, uniting with him, we drink of the water of life forever. Jesus gave us the water that we desperately needed, and that water could only come through striking, but one time, only one time, you do not strike the rock again. John stood at the foot of the cross and he witnessed the piercing of Jesus' side and he saw the flow of blood and water come out of him. Now, I don't think that that was only to be considered medical evidence that he was dead. It certainly was that, but I think it was more than that. I think it was also to show that the water of life flowed from him. It was to confirm Jesus' words, whoever drinks the water I provide will never thirst, but they will have springs of living water welling up to eternal life. So you see the significance of Moses' fault. God is saying to Moses, show my people how my word can bring forth a waterfall of life. But Moses is angry, and understandably so. But in his anger, he misrepresents God to the people. Speaking would have demonstrated God's nearness and his readiness to help and provide and show his mercy. This rock had already been struck. Now all we need to do is talk to him. Moses clouded the people's understanding of that, and he loses his blessing as a result, the blessing that he'd been working toward all those years. May this be a stern and sober warning to all of us that we do nothing to dishonor or to misrepresent the truth of the scriptures, that we remain faithful in every detail to the word of God, lest we ever cloud anyone's understanding of who Christ is and what he has done for us. That he is the one who has been struck. That all we need to do now is look at him like the pole in the desert. All we need to do is speak to him. He is that near and that willing all I can ever say is thank God for Jesus because if Moses is not getting into the promised land, then there is no way that I could. God was purposeful in this plan. He 
took the very best people that Israel had to offer, Miriam, Aaron, with Moses at the head, and said, essentially, the best you've got is really not good enough. It was necessary that Moses not lead these people into the promised land. Think about what might have happened had he done so. Oh, would not the hearts of the people have been so enamored then with Moses and what he had accomplished that they would not have thought twice about the need for a more perfect deliverer? Instead, we are reminded, as we ought to be, of the tragedy of our human condition, of our weakness, our limitation, our inability to save ourselves, our utter helplessness to rectify and redeem our own problem, which is sin. If Moses could not do it, then what hope do the rest of us have? Unless, of course, there is one better than Moses. And praise God, there is. This rock was a picture of Christ. It was a picture of God himself as the answer to their need. He had always been and would always supply their need, just as Jesus is for us. He is our provision, the source of the water of life. On the cross, he poured out his blood and water for our salvation. On the day of Pentecost, he poured out his Holy Spirit as the waters of life. Moses did not get to bring the people into the promised land. Joshua did. Now Joshua, the name, comes from the Hebrew name Yeshua, meaning God is deliverance or Yahweh saves. Jesus' name in Hebrew was also Yeshua, translates in English to Joshua, reminding us, even way back then, that only Jesus can bring us to God. In spite of Moses' failure, and in spite of the destructive and constant complaining of the people, God still poured out water from that rock. God still granted water. Now, he could have said, you know, you people are just awful. You kind of stink, so I'm going to make you wait for your water. But he did not do that. He showed such grace, grace toward the rebellious. It reminds me of that old hymn, He Giveth More Grace. I don't know if any of you know that one. He giveth more grace. His love has no limits. His grace has no measure. His power, no boundary known unto man. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Water for the thirsty, bread for the hungry, home for the homeless, friendship for the lonely, rest for the weary, and forgiveness for the sinful. That is grace. And that is the grace of this story and the grace of our lives. This story is gospel grace fulfilled and magnified in the person and work of Jesus Christ. His grace is overflowing, but we may not presume upon it. Moses learned that. Poor Moses had gone right from Miriam's death to the grumbling of the people to the tragedy at Meribah to the refusal by the king of Edom to pass through his land, to the death of his brother and sidekick Aaron in the span of a few months, he lost his sister, his brother, and the promised land. But as Moses and Aaron climb Mount Hor, God has a kind word for them. He transfers the priestly authority to Aaron's son, and in verse 26, the Lord said, Aaron shall be gathered to his people and shall die there. That's Old Testament language for death. It's actually very special language used only for those who are numbered among the righteous. He would be gathered with those also who came before him who were righteous and trusted and feared the Lord. And his son carries his work. Uh, there's an old saying, God buries his workers and carries on his work. There was to be no interruption.
adoption of God's provision for his people. They were never, ever, not for one second to be without a high priest. And it points us to Hebrews 7, 23 and 24 about the imperfection of the Levitical priesthood. In 23, it says the former priesthood were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in the office. But he, Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Because he continues forever, he has an unchangeable priesthood. Consequently, verse 25, he is able to save to the uttermost. Those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Let me just close with this last thought. I really like the pledge that Moses makes to the king of Edom in verse 17. When he says, we will go along the king's highway. We will not turn aside to the right hand or to the left until we have passed through your territory. I think that's a wonderful prayer. That, Lord, we would remain on your highway, the king of kings highway. And we would not turn from the right hand or to the left until we pass through this territory. Father, we praise you for your word. We praise you for the truth that it fills us with, for the way it buoys us up. We praise you for Jesus. We praise you for the plan that you have had since eternity past. Lord, help us to fully trust in this unbelievable, incorruptible, almighty, gracious God that we would not worry about the things of this life because we know that a God who can do this can do anything. May we live and trust and stand on the rock that is Jesus every moment of every day, now and forever. And may we remain faithfully on your highway, not turning to the right nor to the left, but remain until we pass through this wilderness, this territory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.